Okay, um, so I'm turning on the live stream and let me make sure. Like I said, we are recording from my office here in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, uh, because we have an event that we were supposed to be doing in Jacksonville, Florida, but couldn't. Uh, so I was here earlier, earlier doing a church service for the uh, attendees at the Jacksonville funding tour. So um, when you see the background uh, for today's live stream, it's going to look a little bit different than what you're used to seeing, but uh, we're all still here, so that's great. All right, I wanted to share something with you guys right here uh, because I thought this was interesting, you know, as we look at this virus. And can you guys just double check and make sure that your line is muted? There is somebody out there who continues to talk and it's very disruptive. So can you all just right now, even if you don't think it's you, just go down and mute your phone because uh, I'm not able to seem to turn it off at the uh, administration level. So if everybody could please just mute your phones right now, that'd be great. Um, but I wanted to uh, share this with you right here at the top. It's just something to think about. Please don't argue, just think about it with eyes wide open. Feel free to comment because I always value feedback and opinions. But fight and argue and I'll delete and unfriend you. No room for bullies or irrational opinionated people in my life. Now this is a gentleman named Mark Lane uh, who is in uh, one of my mastermind groups. And here's what he wants us to think about. He says top 10 USA deaths per year. Heart disease, 650,000. Cancer, 600,000. Injuries, 170,000. Respiratory problems, 160,000. Stroke, now understand this is just the United States of America. Stroke, 146,000. Alzheimer's, 121,000. Diabetes, 84,000. Flu and pneumonia, 55,000. Kidney disease, 50,000. Suicide, 47,000. That's 2 million plus deaths per year out of a population of 300 million and a little more. Coronavirus, worldwide 10,000 plus deaths out of a population of 7 billion, not to mention a 90% plus recovery rate. If that math doesn't make some sense to you, then I can't help you. Hey, whoever, whoever is talking, hey, Okay, now somebody has their phone on and is watching the live stream. So, guys, I really need you to listen intently to me now. I need you to turn and put your phones on mute, please. Okay, sounds like it ended. Thank you, whoever that was. Uh, coronavirus, 10,000 worldwide out of a population of 7 billion with 90 plus percent recovery rate. Now, if that math doesn't make some sense to you, then I can't help you. A near global shutdown of all the major countries, mass hysteria, forced quarantines, martial law, and this is only the beginning. I'll bet everything that this will get much further and much worse. Now, I only share that with you. I, I don't have a political agenda here. Uh, but, I mean, we really do need to stop and consider. And, and admittedly, there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, and if the government says, stay in your home, you know, the Bible says, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and render to me what is mine. And I get it. As Christians, we need not be fearful. But at the same time, uh, we do have to follow the rules of this land. Uh, but even with that, I mean, it just seems like such pandemonium and mass hysteria. And I get it. We're, we're, we're doing everything we can to contain it so it doesn't get worse. But my goodness, more people die from talking and texting on their cell phone. Uh, every year than, than this. And right now, cell phone companies have the technology that they could literally turn off your ability to talk on the phone and text while the phone is in motion because they can tell this. Uh, they could literally stop it and they don't. Yet here's this virus, you know, and, and the, the, okay, I'm going to get political, the somewhat political side of me uh, and the um, conspiracy theorist side of me says, you know, for some political parties, a struggling, troubled economy is a good thing. Um, I don't know how anybody could possibly even believe that to be true, but, you know, it is a strange world that we live in. Well, anyway, I'll get off my political and uh, non-medical soapbox because I am not a doctor. 
Um, but food for thought anyway. Turn your Bibles, if you would, please, to 2 Samuel chapter 13. 2 Samuel chapter 13. And this message is titled, Your Kids Are Watching You. Are you being what you want them to be? Are you being what you want them to be? All right. So let's read this together. 2 Samuel chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. In the course of time, Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, or Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David. Amnon became frustrated to the point of illness on account of his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin, and it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. Now, Amnon had a friend named Jonadab, son of Shimea. David's brother Jonadab was a very shrewd man, and he asked Amnon, Why do you, the king's son, look so haggard morning after morning? Won't you tell me? And Amnon said to him, I'm in love with Tamar my brother Absalom's sister. Go to bed and pretend to be ill, Jonadab said. And when your father comes to see you, say to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and give me something to eat. Let her prepare the food in my sight so I may watch her and then eat it from her hand. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. And when the king came to see him, Amnon said to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and make some special bread in my sight so I may eat from her hand. And David sent word to Tamar at the palace, go to the house of your brother Amnon and prepare some food for him. So Tamar went to the house of her brother Amnon, who was lying down. She took some dough, kneaded it, made the bread in his sight and baked it. Then she took the pan and served him the bread, but he refused to eat. Send everyone out of here, Amnon said. So everyone left him. And then Amnon said to Tamar, Bring the food here into my bedroom so I may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the bread she had prepared and brought it to her brother Amnon in his bedroom. But when she took it to him to eat, he grabbed her and said, Come to bed with me, my sister. Don't, my brother, she said to him. Don't force me. Such a thing should not be done in Israel. Don't do this wicked thing. What about me? Where could I get rid of my disgrace? And what about you? You would be like one of the wicked fools in Israel. Please speak to the king. He will not keep me from being married to you. But he refused to listen to her. And since he was stronger than she, he raped her. Then Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. And Amnon said to her, get up and get out. Verse 16, no, she said to him, sending me away would be a greater wrong than what you've already done to me. But he refused to listen to her. And he called his personal servant and said, get this woman out of here and bolt the door after her. So his servant put her out and bolted the door after her. She was wearing a richly ornament robe, for this was the kind of ornament or garment the virgin daughters of the king wore. And Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the ornament ornamented robe she was wearing, and she put her hand on her head and went away, weeping aloud as she went. Her brother Absalom said to her, Has that Amnon, your brother, been with you? Be quiet now, my sister. He is your brother. Don't take this thing to heart. And Tamar lived in her brother Absalom's house, a desolate woman. And when King David heard all this, he was furious. Absalom never said a word to Amnon, either good or bad. He hated Amnon because he had disgraced his sister Tamar. Verse 23, two years later, when Absalom's sheep shearers were at Baal, Hazer, near the border of Ephraim, he invited all the king's sons to come there. And we're going to end there today because we're not going to get any further than that. So let's pray. Lord, we just come to you now as we open up your word. Uh, Lord, admittedly, it's a, a pretty interesting passage, very obscure, and Lord, I'm not sure why uh, you have us here in this passage on this day, uh, but Lord, you do. You have a reason. You have a purpose, and Lord, I pray that you would help each of us to just open up our hearts to your, to your message, to your word, Lord, to what it is you want to tell us and share with us and show us. Lord, help us to be receptive, and Lord, help me to get out of the way so that we can hear from you this morning. Lord, we love you. We thank you for all that you do. We just ask now that you'd speak to us through your word. And in Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. And it came to pass, or as my translation, the New International Version says, in the course of time. It has rightly been said that the that experience is the best teacher if you can afford the tuition. And it's an expensive way to learn the hard way. Therefore, I would rather learn from accounts like this one before us than to pay the high price of learning it on my own. Now, we see here and are introduced to Tamar, who is the beautiful sister of Absalom, daughter Absalom's son of David. Now, Tamar was Absalom's full sister. Both Tamar and Absalom were noted for their physical beauty. We see that in 13.1. We see that in 2 Samuel chapter 14, verse 25. Now their mother, and we don't see this reference here, but their mother was Maka, uh, a princess from the royal house of Talmai in Gesher, which is a small Aramean or Aramean kingdom near what we know as the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee being about 17 miles to the north of Jerusalem. Uh, this is where this woman is from. Now, David had no doubt taken Mecca as his wife in order to establish a peace treaty with her father. Now, the fact that Absalom had royal blood in his veins from his father, as well as from his mother, may have spurred him on his egotistical quest for the kingdom, which we're going to see uh, when we finish the chapter next week. So here we have Tamar and Absalom. They are King David's kids, and their mom is a princess, uh, so also of a royal line. Uh, and as we know, I don't know what it is, but for some reason, it's very common that anybody that is of royalty is usually beautiful. Uh, they say that uh, beauty uh, helps you to rise to the top faster. Uh, but I've seen some pretty ugly, successful people, so I don't know. I don't know if beauty is a requirement. But uh, we know that Absalom and Tamar are very good looking, uh, even though, from what we know in Scripture. Uh, David was believed to be a redheaded man uh, and not as good looking, but maybe they got all their good looks from their mom. I know that my kids did, so thank the Lord for that. Uh, so here we have them. And Amnon became frustrated. Now, Amnon is David's oldest son, so he is a half brother. So they share the same father, they have a different mother. But he is the apparent heir to the throne, Amnon being the oldest son when King David dies, uh, the way it goes, Amnon would be the next king. Now, because of this, it's believed that perhaps Amnon thought, hey, I'm the next king, uh, therefore I should be able to do whatever I want, even if that means having sexual relations with my half-sister. Now, this is an interesting topic because I read some commentators who said that there was nothing wrong or it was not viewed to be wrong that people marry their sister. However, if you look at God's law, just hang a left in your Bibles real quick and let's, let's look at Leviticus uh, chapter 18, beginning in verse 9. Leviticus 18 and verse 9 says... Uh, do not have sexual relations with your sister, either your father's daughter or your mother's daughter, whether she was born in the same home or else well or elsewhere. Do not have sexual relations with your son's daughter or your daughter's daughter. That would dishonor you. Do not have sexual relations with the daughter of your father's wife, born to your father. She is your sister. Verse 12, do not have sexual relations with your father's sister. She is your father's close relative. You can see that God is pretty clear in what you should and should not be doing. Now, in the time of King David, the Pentateuch was there, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, penned by Moses, uh, according to God's desire, God's will, God's word. And they studied it. Now, why does the son of a godly king not know the scripture? 
Now, that's something just to put a pin in and hold it there, okay? Now, he should have known better. So it was evil for him, Amnon, to nurture an abnormal love for his half-sister, and he should have stopped feeding that appetite the moment it started. The sin was not only unnatural, but it violated the standard of sexual purity established by God's law. However, he became so infatuated with Tamar that he really thought he was in love with her, literally to the point of sick. John Corson said he was love sick or more accurately lust sick but he couldn't act on this because in these days all of the king's sons would live on one side of the palace and all of the virgin princesses were kept secluded in their own quarters so here you have half brother in love with sister and you know i'm sure they see everybody at family gatherings but for the most part the the virgin princesses and virginity is is a big thing, and it's very well protected and cherished uh, back in King David's days, not so much in our day, but we'll talk more about that. And Amnon just, he was in love with her, or so he thought. So because of this, he's kind of hemming and hawing around, and, you know, he's mopey, and he's sad, and oh, I just, there's no way I could have her. Verse 3. Now, Amnon had a friend named Jonadab, and Jonadab was the son of Shimea, which is David's brother. Okay? So, what that means is that Jonadab is Amnon's cousin. Okay? Now, here, if you look at 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 9, David's brother is referred to as Shama, but here he is known as Shimea. So, this is Joe, Joe, or Amnon's cousin on his dad's side. So his cousin, who was a very shrewd man that we see here in chapter, in verse 3. Now, just so you all are aware, a shrewd man in the Bible does not mean shrewd in a good way, right? Sometimes shrewd can be, you know, wise, crafty, cunning, uh, but here, not so much. Uh, even the famous Broadway play, The Taming of the Shrew, uh, you can see that that word is not used in a positive content, but he's shrewd. Now, it's also believed that this Jonadab was probably a minor official in the palace. So not only is he Jonah, he's Amnon's cousin, but it's also believed that he works for the king, David. So he asks his cousin, Amnon, he says, Amnon, why do you look so haggard? Morning after morning, won't you tell me? Verse 4. And Amnon said to him, Dude, I'm in love with Tamar. Now, get this. He does not say, I'm in love with Tamar, my sister. He says, I'm in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Now, Absalom and Tamar are full blood brother and sister. Same mom, same dad. But here we see Amnon trying to justify his lustful desire by diminishing really what's going on here. He's saying, I'm in love with my sister. You know, and, and, and we still do that to this day. You know, well, uh, if I only look at it for a short period of time, if I only stay just for a minute, if I only have a couple of drinks, if I only, you know, wear a condom, if I only, you know, ask for forgiveness after the act. You know, sin hasn't changed much, much in the last several thousand years, has it? It still wants to justify bad behavior. And even worse is when people that are close to us, friends and family, when they not only try to help us get away with sin, but when they too justify bad behavior. So here Jonadab comes to his cousin and he says, hey man, I got this all figured out. Look, this is easy. He says, all you need to do is pretend you're sick. Then you can ask your dad to have Tamar, you know, bring in some chicken soup. You know, chicken soup is good for the soul. So he says, hey, you know what? That's not a half bad idea. Hmm. That's exactly what I'm going to do. So Amnon 
laid down and he pretended that he was sick. And he's moaning and he's groaning. And, you know, I'm sure that at some point the servants came in and said, Amnon, are you okay? And he said, no, I'm not feeling good. good. Can you go get my dad? So one of the servants goes and they get King David. So here's Amnon laying in bed. King David comes in and he sees Amnon laying there and he says, Amnon, what's going on, man? Are you okay? Now I'm paraphrasing here, so please forgive me. And Amnon says to his dad, King David, he said, Dad, I don't feel good. And, you know, the thing that would really make me feel better is if you could have my sister. See, now suddenly it's his sister. When he's justifying the sinfulness that he's about to commit, he refers to Tamar as his brother's sister. But now, because he wants to get his dad to go along with it, he refers to her as his sister, saying, Hey, you know, we're just family. I don't have any, I don't have any ill will here. I don't, I'm not thinking any sinful thoughts. So, you know, Dad, I just want my sister to come and make me some food. So, verse 7. David sends word to Tamar at the palace. Now, here's a thought. Anybody in our lives who makes it easy for us to sin is certainly not much of a friend. In fact, by following this advice, Amnon is going to end up a rapist, committing incest with his half-sister, and getting killed. We may be more vulnerable to the advice of our relatives because we are close to them. However, we must make sure to evaluate every piece of advice by God's standards, even when it comes from relatives. Now, I don't think that, Tam that, that Amnon has any excuse here. I mean, he could certainly point to uh, Jonadab and say, well, you know, Jonadab made me do it. And I think that we all have gotten into the habit of pointing and saying, you know, the devil made me do it. Here's the bottom line. If we are out of line, if we are committing sin, it doesn't matter who told us to do it. We are wrong. We are in the wrong. Now, I think that too often we get bad advice from well-intentioning people. You know, and, and, and I, I was talking about this this morning because when we're out on the road uh, putting on real estate investment seminars and I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll just listen to the conversations that are being had and I'll overhear people saying, well, you know what, here's what you do. You just cover up the hole in the roof. You don't need to put a new roof on it. Just cover the roof up and, and don't tell anybody and nobody will be any of the wiser. Or they'll say, oh, you know what? Uh, yeah, you know, if you just pay your people under the table and and not report it, you know, yeah, technically you probably should report it, but you know, it's only a couple of employees, it's only a couple thousand dollars, it's no big deal. Don't tell the government that you have employees, just pay them under the table. I can't tell you how many Christian-owned businesses I've seen that are paying people under the table. And then I see Christians advising other Christians to do the exact same thing. You know, just because a Christian or supposed Christian tells you you should do something, every piece of advice should be tested against the Word of God. And what does the Word of God tell us about honorable business practices and dealings? Render to Caesar what is Caesar. If the government says we need to pay taxes, we need to pay taxes. Now, there's certainly loopholes and there are legitimate write-offs and there are things that we as business owners have the ability to do legally. But, you know, I, I've met Christians and I was one of them. I hadn't filed my taxes for like eight years. Why? Well, it wasn't because I was purposely trying to get away with something. Uh, I had an accountant who said he was filing my taxes, and I had signed all of my returns, and I assumed that he had filed them. And, you know, I wasn't really smart enough to know the difference, and admittedly, I didn't check. You know, it's the old adage, in business and in life, uh, you don't get what you expect, you get what you inspect. And I had failed to inspect whether or not that was happening. So I go eight years in and realize, ha, 
my taxes haven't been filed. And that wasn't even until 2006 when Jacqueline was pregnant with the twins and uh, decided to come be a stay-at-home mom for a period of time. And she came and worked with me in my business. And first day she's at the office, she comes to me and she says, why haven't you filed your taxes? I'm like, what are you talking about? I filed my taxes. She says, no, you haven't. So she contacts the IRS and the IRS says, yep, you haven't filed your taxes. And within a matter of days, they slapped a $180,000 federal tax lien against me. And I deserved it because I wasn't checking. Now, again, I wasn't intentionally trying to get away with anything. I just didn't know better. But I've met Christians that are intentionally trying to get away with something. And let me just tell you this, you guys, if you're not being honorable in your business as it relates to following the letter of the law and doing what God has called you to do, how can you have any expectation that God is going to bless your business? So, you know, you can tithe as much as you want. You can pray and add your amens and raise your holy hands at church during worship all you want. But if in your heart of hearts you know that there are certain things you're doing and intentionally trying to get away with something, God is going to reveal that. Just like he did with David. And we'll talk about that here in just a moment. We may be more vulnerable to the advice of our relatives because we are close to them. However, we must make sure to evaluate every piece of advice by God's standards, even when it comes from relatives or other Christians or other Christian business owners. We got to be careful, you guys. You know, I think that more people are turned away from Christ as they look at some of us as Christians than are turned on to Christ as they look at some of us as Christians. Because, you know, there isn't much difference from us and what the rest of the world is doing. Well, okay, if you're a Christian and you're acting like that, then I guess I must be a Christian too. I think it was J. Vernon McGee who said more people have been turned away from the church by the people in it that were ever discouraged from going into it by the people outside of it. And boy, what a true statement that is. Verse 7. So David sends words to Tamar at the palace, and he says, Hey, Tamar, I need you to go to your brother's house, Amnon, and prepare for him some food. Now, you know, I have to believe that for David, he's not thinking that there's anything weird going on. You know, just go to your older brother's house. He's next in line to be king. He's sick. Go take care of your brother. So Tamar went to the house of her brother Amnon, who was lying down. She took some dough, kneaded it, made the bread in his sight, and baked it. Then she took the pan and served him the bread, but he refused to eat. So everyone, he said, get out of here. Servants, leave. So everyone leaves him. And then Amnon said to Tamar, bring the food here into my bedroom so I may eat from your hand. Now, it is at this point in time that red flags and bells and sirens should have been going off because bedrooms are for sleeping not for eating. Now, yes, I get it. He's sick in bed. And, you know, in Tamar's defense, how could she even think that her older brother is, is thinking in this direction? So, sir, brother, verse 11. But when she takes the bread to him to eat, he grabs her and says, come to bed with me, my sister. Verse 10 or verse 12. Tamar says, don't, my brother, don't force me. Such a thing should not be done in Israel. Don't do this wicked thing. What about me? She says, where, where can I get rid of my disgrace? And what about you? You would be like one of the wicked fools in Israel. Please speak to the king. He will not keep me from being married to you. Tamar tries to appeal to Amnon's logic, but he doesn't listen. He ignores the warnings given him. That's what lust does. It doesn't listen to the warning. It blocks out what's being said 
by a concerned parent, a friend, or a pastor. When we want something, when we lust after something, we got to have it. We want it. Now, that is not drive. That is not desire. That is sin. And it may not be, you know, sexual relations with somebody that we're not married to. It might be, you know, lust of the flesh. It might be lust of money. It might be lust of, of, of popularity. It might be lust of uh, pick something. Lust and sin do not listen to warning. It blocks out what's being said by a concerned parent, friend, or pastor. Truth be told, love and lust are very different. After Amnon raped his half-sister, his love turned to hate. And although he had claimed to be in love, he was actually overcome by lust. Love is patient. Lust, however, requires immediate satisfaction. Love is kind. Lush is harsh. Love, lust, love does not demand its own way. Lust does. You can read about these, character, these characteristics of real love in 1 Corinthians 13. Lust may feel like love at first, but when physically expressed, it results in self-disgust and hatred of the other person. If you just can't wait, what you feel is not true love. Verse 14, but he refused to listen to her, and since he was stronger than she, he raped her. Then Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. And Amnon said to her, get up and get out. No, she said to him, sending me away would be a greater wrong than what you've already done to me. Rape was strictly forbidden by God. Deuteronomy 22, verse 28 and 29. Why was sending Tamar away an even greater crime? Well, by throwing her out, Amnon made it look as if Tamar had made a shameful proposition to him. He was, in fact, the king to be, and there were no witnesses on her behalf because he had gotten rid of the servants. His crime against her destroyed her chances of marriage because she was no longer a virgin and she could not be given in marriage. One commentator said, young lady, are you listening to this story? Dear sister, this is reality. Once Amnon gets what he wants, he kicks Tamar out and locks the door behind her, leaving her to go away crying. Now, it sounds old-fashioned, but abstinence was mandated by God for a reason. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 says, Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside of the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2 says, Each man should have sexual relations with his own wife, and each woman with her own husband. God reserved sexual relationships for marriage. Tamar's argument here is, come on, Amnon, you're, you're the oldest son of the king. You're, you're in line to be king. And while, you know, God specifically said that we're not to have sex with our brothers or our sisters, you're the king. So if you ask the king, he can probably make it happen. So if, if this union is going to, is something that you desire, then let's do it the right way. Let's, let's get married. Imagine if women today made the same argument as Tamar. Imagine if women today said, you know what, I'm not going to have sexual relations with anybody until I'm married. Because that's God's plan, that's God's will, that's God's desire, that's what God set up for us. 
but we want it now. I remember when I was 19, I started dating a, a girl and my dad immediately did not like her. And he said, Lee, stay away from that girl. She is trouble. But dad, she's really pretty. Lee, stay away from that girl. Now, what would have happened if King David would have said the same thing to his son, Amnon? Amnon, she's your sister. Stay away from your sister. Now, we don't see that from King David, but wouldn't we make the assumption that our kids know better? No, we shouldn't make that assumption. So my dad says, Lee, stay away from that, stay away from that woman. Now, up until this point, I was, you know, uh, very involved at church. I was very involved with the youth group. Um, I, I wasn't a saint by any means, but uh, I was not having sexual intercourse. But something about this girl I started dating, I just couldn't resist. And so I started having sexual intercourse with her, and she was not my wife. And I knew better. And so this went on for a few months. And I'll never forget this. I, I, I was coming down the stairs to go somewhere. And my dad corners me and he says, Lee, I need to talk to you. And he sits me down. And he says, are you and your girlfriend having sex? And I just looked him in the face and I said, yes, we are. And he said, okay. He said, Lee, are you a Christian? I said, yes. He said, you've invited Jesus into your heart. You made him your Lord and Savior. I said, yes. He said, okay. Do you know that the sex that you're having is wrong? That, that God doesn't want you having sex outside of marriage? I said, yes, I know that. And he said to me, he said, are you going to stop? And I looked at him and I said, no, I don't think that I am. And he said, well, okay. He said, then unfortunately, I have to do what God tells me to do because as the head of this household, as your father, I am mandated by God what I'm supposed to do. And the Bible says that when somebody calls themselves a Christian who openly lives a life of sin, that you are to have nothing to do with them. It says put them out. And so my dad says, Lee, I need you to go get everything out of your room. And unfortunately, you can't stay in my home. Now, some parents hear that story and they think, what a terrible father. How could he kick his son out of his house? And I have to tell you, I wish that more parents had the courage to do what the Bible says and kick their kids out of the house. Because right now, some of you have kids living in your basement. They're having sexual relations with their, with their boyfriend or their girlfriend or their boyfriend, boyfriend, or their girlfriend, girlfriend, and you're allowing this to take place in your home. You're allowing your kids underage to drink, to get drunk in your home. You're allowing kids to lay around and not get a job and not work and not provide for themselves. And, 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 and you're allowing this terrible behavior. Let's call a spade a spade. Sin is sin. The Bible's pretty clear, pretty black and white. It's sin. Now, I left there, and I had my room and everything cleaned out in no time. If it was 15 minutes, it was 10. I was ready to go, and I'm like, sweet, I'm out of here. Dad punched my ticket. I don't have to come home anymore. I can go do and be and, and experience whatever I want. And I left there on a holy terror. And I didn't talk to my dad for well over two years. Christmas, no. Thanksgiving, no. Phone calls? No. Because the Bible says, with such a man, do not eat. If somebody is openly living in sin, and living in sin does not mean, you know, it, it's not just contained to, you know, cheating on your spouse. That's adultery. Or having sexual intercourse with somebody who's not your spouse. That's fornication. 
It can be drunkenness. It can be laziness, slothfulness. It can be uh, obesity, you know, overeating. You know, all of these are things that the Lord says, no, let's not do that. You know, at the end of the day, our kids are looking to us to set a godly example for them. Now, admittedly, parents, it's gotten real hard. You know, society wants us to believe that recreational sex is fun. And so I Googled this. Today we celebrate premarital sex and we encourage it. So I brought Jacqueline over and I said, hey, we're, I'm doing this study. I said, I need to Google hookup sites. I said, but I want you to be aware of it because if you look at my browser later, I want you to know why it's there. So I simply went into Google, please don't do this. And I just typed in best hookup site. And here's just a small sample of what I found. One site called Adult Friend Finder, live videos and more monthly visitors than eHarmony makes Adult Friend Finder great for finding a down for anything fling. Best for guaranteeing no strings attached. Another site called Pure says it's like Snapchat for sex, where hookups are spontaneous and impersonal. Another site, or best for finding mature partners called Match, says if your age makes you feel like a certified creep on Tinder, Match is more mature, a more mature place to find an experienced booty call. Lastly, one that's best for casual sex is Tinder, and it says our love-hate relationship with Tinder notwithstanding, we can't ignore the fact that it's a tried and true option when all you want is some casual sex. And we wonder why we see a reduction in marriages, an increase in single parents, an increase in single mom households, and kids growing up in broken homes. Guys, we gotta be better than this. You know, if we're not leading and guiding our kids and intentionally keeping them away from seeing this kind of stuff, this is exactly what they're going to see. And the world says, hey, we're just having fun. This is this is just a fun thing to do. I'm just experimenting. I don't believe that there's anything more damaging or painful than sex outside of marriage, whether it's consensual or not, because every time, every partner, you are desensitized to truly being able to experience your spouse in, in, in that way, you know, and it is so out of vogue to be a virgin when you get married. I still remember in junior high school getting laughed at, oh, you're still a virgin? How come you're still a virgin? That was 25 years, 30 years ago. Oh, you're still a virgin? Oh, that's, that's what, does anybody like you? Like that's the, the stamp of approval. Oh, you had sex and you're 12 years old. Good for you. This is what they're hearing. Verse 18. So his servant put her out and bolted the door after her. She was wearing a richly ornamented robe. For this was the kind of garment the virgin daughters of the king wore. And Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the ornamented robe she was wearing, and she put her hand on her head and went away weeping aloud as she went. I mean, Tamar is wondering, how could he have done this to me? He claimed he had his deep love for me. Oh, precious people, may the Holy Spirit give you understanding that this is what happens when lust is the main ingredient. When lust dominates a relationship, it always ends up in sorrow, ultimately in death. How many times is the phrase, if you loved me, you would do this for me? And this is what our daughters are hearing from boys. You know, if you loved me, you'd, you'd perform this sexual favor on me. If you loved me, you'd have sex with me. Well, I'm saving myself for marriage. What, what are you, what are you, from 1930? Saving yourself from marriage? Nobody does that anymore. Come on. 
and they go on the internet and they watch movies and you know premarital sex is celebrated and committing adultery is celebrated you know desperate housewives you know every one of them's having an affair these are the shows you know i don't know how you can even preach this sermon or have these discussions without coming off as being an old fuddy duddy you know an old fashioned old oh, nobody believes that anymore well God's word doesn't change. It's, it's, it's been the same for thousands of years. It's still important to God, but Satan has done a really, really good job of desensitizing all of us, myself included. So Tamar goes to her brother, verse 20, and her brother says to her, has Amnon, your brother, been with you? It's the first thing he says. Be quiet now, my sister. He's your brother. Don't take this thing to heart. And Tamar lived in her brother Absalom's house, a desolate woman. Absalom says to his sister, I'll take care of this. And although his statement sounds noble, Absalom will use this situation to destroy Amnon, one of the heirs to the throne. Thus, by killing Amnon, he'd have a better chance of being the next king. Verse 21, when King David heard all this, he was furious. David is angry. His oldest son raped his daughter and he's understandably upset. Yet, although David is very upset, he does nothing. How could this be? Well, let's turn back in our Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 11. And we're going to look at verses 2 through 5. One evening, David got up from his bed, walked around on the roof on, of the palace, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. And the man said, Isn't this Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he slept with her. Then he went back home, and the woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. Now, we covered this story just a few weeks ago. Now, from the time of David's sin with Bathsheba to Amnon's sin with Tamar is a period of about two years. Now, as we were studying chapter 11, the one thing that we didn't consider as we were going through David's sin was the kids that were in his house watching David's actions. I titled this message, Your Kids Are Watching You. Are you being what you want them to be? David's kids watched him have an affair with Bathsheba, watched him arrange for her husband's murder, watched him bring her into his house and marry her seven days later, and then, about seven months after they got married, she has a baby. Now, the kids aren't dumb. Uh, it's amazing how smart kids are. I mean, my kids are 12 and 13, and I'm handing them my cell phone to show me how to use the thing. Kids are smart, and they are very intuitive, and they pick this stuff up. And what they see the parents doing is exactly what they're going to do. So, are we displaying a godly example for our kids so that they will be good parents, good partners, good husbands and wives, godly leaders? Or are our kids seeing us living with people that we're not married to? You know, I, I've met people at church. It's like, hey, when did you guys get married? Oh, well, we're not, we're, 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 we're not married. Uh, but we've been together 20 years, and we've been living together, and, you know, we have kids together. So, you know, common law, we're married. All right, well, guess what your kids are going to do? Your kids aren't going to get married either, and they're going to go shack up with somebody, and 20 years later, they're going to be in a, a, an unmarried situation because they saw mom and dad doing it. Or they see mom and dad, you know, drinking and, and getting drunk, and they think, oh, well, if mom and dad do it, it must be okay. Or they see mom and dad spending money recklessly, being irresponsible with money. 
And when the kids grow up, suddenly they are irresponsible with money. Mom and dad, listen carefully. This is Satan's favorite tactic to get you to allow your kids to see movies they ought not see, to see, to listen to music they ought not hear, to not mind when they say they're moving in with their boyfriend or girlfriend, letting them share the same room when they come to your house to visit and they aren't married. Christian parents letting their kids live in their house with their boyfriend or girlfriend sleeping in the same room, same bed, not married. Really? Okay, Lee, this is too much. You know, this is 2020. You're talking like it's still 1910. You know, that's that's that that doesn't apply. No, it does apply, mom and dad. It's our job as parents. It's your job as parents. It's your job, your job as grandparents to display godly characteristics in your life, in your marriage, in your home. Are your kids seeing a godly example? Because for many people, their parents are the only true mentor they will ever have. The only true guidance counselor that they will ever follow. But Satan says to us, he says, think of all the sins you commit every day. You can't get on your kids. You watch rated R movies too. You can't get on your kids. You used to watch pornography and look at Playboys which you're over at your friend's house. You can't get on your kids for that. You can't get on your kids for swearing. You know, I've heard some of the worst language come out of Chris, Christian teenagers' mouths while their parents are upstairs in the sanctuary praying. Why, mom and dad, are we allowing this behavior? Just because you made some mistakes when you were a kid does not mean you excuse your children from making the same mistakes. Now, I made mistakes as a, as a, as a youth. I committed a, a fornication. Does that mean my kids are allowed to? Does that mean I should say, kids, this is wrong? Or should I say, yeah, you know what, kids, I'd love to, I'd love to advise you otherwise, but I'm, I'm a sinful man, and, um, well, you do what you got to do. No, that's not what we do. David was crippled by the condemnation of Satan. And there are men and women who will not tell their sons and daughters what to do and what not to do because they've given in to the David syndrome. Well, I'm not a very good person either, so who am I to condemn you or, or to correct you for your bad behavior? You're the parent. That's who you are. Don't let them do that. We need men and women who have courage to speak the truth. Mom and dad, be wise. Young people understand God records this story for a reason. To tell you and me as parents that we have got to step it up. Christian parents need to realize that they need to spend time training their children. And don't get the impression that you're raising a little angel. There are many parents who treat a child as if he were a cross between an angel and a delicate piece of china. They believe that if they apply, this is J. Vernon McGee, he says, they believe that if they apply the board of education to the seat of knowledge, they will break him in pieces or he or she will come apart. Now, we've all been to church with the obnoxious, screaming baby, Eh, let's go with child. Babies, they're allowed to scream. They don't know any better. But a child, eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old, running around, not minding its parents. Proverbs 23, 13 says, withhold not correction from the child. For if you beat them with the rod, he shall not die. Withhold not correction from the child. Mom and dad, just because your kids have grown up does not mean they are no longer your child. They are still your kids. 
And if you see them doing things as adults that you know is wrong, you need to call them out on it. You need to correct them. You need to say, son, daughter, you are out of line here. Son, why are you living with a woman that you're not married to? Well, dad, you and mom lived together for eight years before you got married. What's the problem? Well, the problem is, is that God said not to do that. Well, you did it. Doesn't make it was doesn't mean it was right. My kids lately have been on this. Well, so and so did it. I said this just yesterday. I said their bad behavior does not justify yours. David did nothing to Amnon. Didn't confront him. Didn't talk to him about it. Now, mom and dad, some of you, you have kids that are toying around with recreational drugs and you're letting them smoke marijuana in your basement. Whoa, but Lee, it's legal. I don't care if it's legal or not. It shouldn't be happening in your home and you should nip it in the butt and stop it. Because here's what happens if you don't. Marijuana is considered to be a, gate, a gateway drug. You know, I like the way marijuana makes me feel. So, you know, I wonder if cocaine would make me feel better. I think I'll try some cocaine. And pretty soon we go from cocaine to crystal meth to, you know, pick one. Kids popping pills, kids stealing pills out of your medicine cabinet, you laughing it off, or don't ever do that again, you. Not taking it seriously. David did nothing. He didn't correct Amnon, didn't approach Amnon, didn't want to, you know, cause a ruckus. Well, you know, he's 28 years old. He can do his own thing. No, mom and dad. Amnon is going to be killed. And if you don't get your kids in line and get them off of the drugs and get them off of the booze and get them out of doing stupid stuff, they're going to be dead. And some of you have already lost kids to drugs and alcohol and, and crazy things because you didn't correct them and address it when you saw it the first time. And I can't even imagine what that's like. To spend the rest of your life knowing that you could have stopped it. Knowing that had you been courageous in the very early days when you saw the behavior, you could have corrected it. You could have changed it. Now, unfortunately for some of you, your kids are gone. But for those of you watching this that still have kids that are not acting the way you know they should be acting, not displaying godly character. This is your wake up call, mom and dad, to call those kids and sit them down and say, I do not agree with what you are doing. And I am telling you this in love because I am your parent and I care about you a lot and I don't want to see you get hurt. As I was leaving, the house that day while sitting in my dad's living room. He said, Lee, before you go, I want to pray with you. I said, all right, pray with me, fine. And in his prayer, he said, Lord, Lee's actions, much like David's, are going to require punishment because every good father who loves his child and God loves us will punish their children. He said, Lord, I would ask that whatever punishment Lee has coming to him because of his sinful lifestyle, that you would put it on me, that you would give it to me. He said, Amen, I left. And I spent the next two years in constant fear that something terrible was going to happen my, to my dad because of that prayer. Because he said, God, he needs to be punished, but punish me, don't punish him. Now, 
thank the Lord. My dad's still with us. And that couldn't have been an easy conversation for him to have either. He could have just, you know, turned a blind eye, not addressed it. I was pretty clever. I was pretty sneaky. He didn't have to ask me. He could have just, you know, unless I catch him in the act, I don't, I don't want to know. Don't ask, don't tell. He certainly could have gone that direction. But he loved me too much to say nothing. Do you love your kids enough to say something? If you know that their lifestyle is not in accordance with God's will, will you have the courage to approach them on it? Because if you don't, it could be the beginning of something that's going to get worse and worse and worse and before you know it, they're gone. And the worst part of that entire scenario is they could actually die without having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, when you die, the Bible says you go to hell. There's no purgatory. There's no waiting period. There's no, you know, some, somewhere between heaven and hell that you wait in and somebody can pray you out of. That is not how it works. The Bible is very clear. If you do not accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, before you die, you go to hell. Oh, this is hell, fire, and brimstone preaching. No, this is the Bible. This is what God says. Don't fight him. This is what he says. Here's another lie of Satan. In 1963, after two landmark decisions, Ingle versus Vitale in 1962, and Abington School District versus Shemp in 1963, the Supreme Court established what is now the current prohibition of state-sponsored prayer in U.S. schools. Shortly after they banned prayer in school, they banned corporal punishment. The period of time between 1960 and 1980 is what is known as the sexual revolution, also known as a time of sexual liberation, which was a social movement that challenged traditional codes of behavior related to sexuality and interpersonal relationships throughout the United States and subsequently the wider world and from the 1960s to the 1980s. Sexual liberation included increased acceptance of sex outside of traditional heterosexual monogamous relationships, primarily marriage, and the normalization of contraception, the pill, public nudity, pornography, premarital sex, homosexuality, masturbation, alternative forms of sexuality, and the legalization of abortion, which followed in 1973. We talked about abortion last week. 46 million babies have been murdered in this country since Roe versus Wade was passed. Now, could that have been God's grace? Because God knew that if that child was born to that parent, that parent would not have raised that child in godly principles, and there's no way that child would have ever made it to heaven? I don't know. I know that God hates murder and God hates abortion. I know that. But you know what he hates more than the, that? He hates it when we don't accept responsibility and be who he has created us to be. And that is lovers and followers of him. Another strike here against David is the fact that he had multiple wives and many children. As a king with many heavy responsibilities, how much time do you think he spent in rearing his kids? The problem with many of us is that we probably have neglected our families for the sake of our career thinking that our families are better off if we spend more of our time chasing the almighty dollar or climbing the corporate ladder. And we've excused our neglect on the basis that we are doing important work. Guilty. I'm guilty of this. I work a lot. 
And I justify it by saying things like, I love to work, work is fun. And while that's a true statement, so should being spend, spending time with my family, that should be fun too. I should desire and crave that. You know, I see some people that tear out of here at five o'clock and I always step out of my office and I go, really? The clock hits five o'clock and suddenly there's no more work left to do? But those people want to get home to be with their families. Where are my priorities? So in closing, what our kids see us do, they do. If they see us being lazy, they're lazy. If they see us not trying very hard, they don't try very hard. If they see us allowing ourselves to be controlled by someone else, like a spouse, a boss, a family member, a mom or a dad, they too will suffer the same fate of being controlled. If they see us abusing our bodies, the bottle, drugs, women, men, pornography, not being faithful to our spouse, getting divorced, there's a very good chance they will as well. We are the closest thing to a mentor our kids are ever going to have. Whether you think they are watching you or not, they are. Now, I googled Bible verses about parenting. That was my Google search. Bible verses about parenting. The first verse that came up with was Colossians 3.21, which says, Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. The second verse that came up was Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, and it says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. Now, I want to talk to just the dads. Dads. Notice that the first two verses that pop up under verses about parenting address you and me, dads. Not moms. You know, so many households, the mom is the one pushing the kids to church. The mom is the one taking them to Sunday school. Dad's out playing golf. Dad's staying home watching football. Dad's out skiing. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, fathers. Bring your kids up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. Dads, we need to do a better job. We are not getting it done. And how can we see that? Because we see it in the end product that is our kids. Now, some of you have great kids and you've been great dads. But now you have grandkids and they're still watching you. <laughs> my kids talk about my, grand, my, my parents all the time. They still watch us. Proverbs 13, 24 says, Whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Start children off the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. Proverbs 29, 15 says, A rod and a reprimand impart wisdom, but a child left undisciplined disgraces his mother. Proverbs 29, verse 17 says, Discipline your children, and they will give you peace. They will bring you the delights you desire. Here's the bottom line. It is never too late to provide your children with godly correction, godly wisdom, and godly counsel. If your kids are grown and gone, they still look up to you. Time to show them the person you truly want them to see you be. If you haven't regularly attended church, start. If you haven't made prayer a daily part of your life, start. If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, start one. Your kids will look up to you and use you as an example or an excuse the rest of their life. Which one do you want them using your life for? I'm going to say it again because I want this to, I want this to settle in real deep. Your kids will look up to you and use you as an example or an excuse the rest of their life. And we've all met the kids of the parents who blew it. Mom didn't have a steady job. Kids don't have a steady job. Mom couldn't keep a steady relationship. Kids can't keep a steady relationship. Dad got divorced multiple times. 
kids have been divorced multiple times. Dad had an affair, son had an affair. The things that we do, our kids see us doing, and they will mimic it and mirror it and follow it. And do you know why? Because they look up to you, they respect you, and they want you to treat them the way God treats us. He holds us accountable, he corrects us when we step out of line, and he loves us unconditionally, so much so that he doesn't hesitate to discipline us when, he, when we need it. Whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. Mom and dad, I don't care if you're 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years old, I don't care how old you are, and I don't care how far along and how far gone you think your kids are, there is still time to make positive corrections in the parent you've been and the parent they see you being. Don't accept mediocrity. Don't accept, I, there's nothing I can do now at this point. No, you can start changing you. Ask God to, to change your heart, to change your mind. Watch what he does with your relationship with your kids. It's going to be incredible. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for, Lord, a very painful reminder of what you expect from us as parents. Lord, I pray for the, the person that's been sitting here listening, knowing that they haven't set a very good example in their home. They haven't been a very good dad. They haven't been a very good mom. Lord, their life has been disruptive. They're, they've been scattered, can't keep a job, can't keep a, a relationship, can't keep money. Lord, they want to be better. And Lord, I pray that you would help each and every one of us to be a better parent. Lord, to not blow it like David, not to, not to let our past justify not correcting them. And Lord, so often we hold back because we know we did it. Lord, help us to not be scared to be corrective. Help us not be afraid to tell our kids the things that they need to hear. Even though it won't make us popular, it'll make us sound old fashioned. Or even if it means they got to move out of our basement and stop stop sleeping in, in their rooms together and, and using marijuana and drugs and alcohol in our house. Lord, help us to kick them out in Jesus' name. Lord, empower the people on this call that know they need to do that and they have been hesitating because they don't want to be mean. Lord, help them to be mean in Jesus' name because that's what needs to happen. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for making everything black and white. And Lord, thank you for shedding light on the things that we'd rather not hear. We love you, Lord. We are grateful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's important for you guys to know that He's the Solution Ministries was started in October of 2009 over 10 years ago. And 10 years ago, we started in Matthew chapter one, and we've just been picking a, a book of the Bible and we study it verse by verse, line by line. And we have a lot of new friends on our call here today, and that's why I want to make sure that everyone understands this. This chapter was not chosen because I knew you were going to be here. This is just where we happened to land on March 22nd. So if God brought you here today to hear that uncomfortable message, know that it was for a reason, and I pray that you will not allow it to go to waste. God wanted you to hear that. He wanted me to hear that. And I pray that we would take it and do amazing and great things with it. If anybody needs prayer, if you have a situation where you've got some kids that are being unruly that... You know, maybe as a parent, you've blown it, you've dropped the ball, and you want to pray about it. We'd love to pray with you. 
you can call us at 800-461-0216. Again, 800-461-0216. Or you can go to our chat line at uh, He's the Solution Ministries, uh, He's the Solution.com. You can go to our, also go to our, our Facebook page, uh, He's the Solution. Just go in there, type it in. Uh, but whatever your needs are, we'd love to pray with you guys. Uh, again, our prayer line is 800-461-0216. Uh, also, I want to remind everybody about the Be Bold for Jesus conference. Uh, seats are filling up every single week. Uh, so again, as I've mentioned, you guys uh, use this opportunity where hotels are, are very inexpensive, airline tickets are very inexpensive. Now's the time to book your travel, uh, and that's for October 23, 24, and 25. Uh, right here in beautiful Coeur d'Alene, which you can see there behind me. Um, but anyway, thank you all for being here today. God bless you again. If you need prayer, please call us 800-461-0216. Until next time, God bless you guys. Have a great week. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>